Heavenly Father, may your name be glorified in all that we do. And uh, above all, Lord, may we reduce that you may increase, may we decrease in everything, that Christ alone may be seen in everything that we do. And uh, give us your own righteousness and let uh, Christ dwell in our hearts by faith. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, so we looked at uh, part one of uh, how do you study the Bible as we lay the ground for this series of uh, the prophets. And uh, we want to look at part two of the same. We just read through Miller's rule of uh, interpretation, and we want to go into details with those um, rules. And so these are the 14 rules and I'd like us to share in these 14 rules, there's some material to cover. And uh, we read thus in Review and Herald, February 25, 1890, paragraph 4. We read, The truth has been represented as a treasure hid in a field the which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. The man who had bought the field will plough every part of it to make himself possessor of the treasure. Thus it is with the word of God. It is filled with precious things. It is a field containing the unsearchable riches of Christ. Yet many who teach the truth have no ambition to become Bible students. And do not work the mind that contains the precious jewels of truth. They get a runaway of a few discourses which they think will make them pass as preachers. But it is impossible for them to bring from the treasure house of God's word things new and old. They are not thoroughly furnished for every good work and are unable to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so, truth is only um proper if uh, we understand it for ourselves and by self through the emanation of the holy spirit and not to rely on other people it is a treasure that uh, can be enjoyed when uh, we buy the field by ourselves and plow and see the treasures in them otherwise if uh, we continue relying on uh, our favorite commentaries our favorite preachers and uh, uh, many other teachers who come to us as having the truth then we shall have trouble uh, at the end of the time because we are told that uh, false prophets shall arise, false teachers shall arise in the end times, and they shall deceive many. And so, looking at these rules once again, rule number one, every word must have its proper bearing on the subject represented, subject presented in the Bible, proof, Matthew 5, 18. This is James White in Life Incidents, page 35, paragraph 1, uh, 1868. And so the Bible verse given is Matthew 5, 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. If I jot or a uh, tittle in the Bible will not pass, then how come we are so often to pass by the jots and the tittles when we don't understand them? If you don't understand a word, then do what? Consult a dictionary. Consult a dictionary if um, uh, it is necessary. Every word has a proper has an proper purpose in the scripture in connection with the subject being studied. There is no jot or title that does not belong and should not be considered or understood while studying. And so 
uh, one thing we have realized that God does not waste words. God does not waste words. And when he gives us his word, it should be studied in totality. In the Ministry of Healing, page 48, paragraph 1. After the multitude had been fed, there was an abundance of food. Jesus bade his disciples gather up the fragments that remained, that nothing be lost. John 6, 12. These words meant more than putting the food into baskets. The lesson was twofold. Nothing is to be wasted. We are not to let sleep no temporal advantage. We should neglect nothing that will serve to benefit a human being. Let everything be gathered up that will relieve the necessities of earth's hungry ones. With the same carefulness are we to treasure the bread from heaven to satisfy the needs of the soul. By every word of God we are to live. Nothing that God has spoken is to be lost. Not one word that concerns our eternal salvation are to we to neglect. Not one word is to fall useless to the ground. Man shall not live by bread alone, but from, by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Rule number two. All scripture is necessary and may be understood by a diligent application and study. Proof 2 Timothy 3. Uh, verse 15 and 17. This is Life Incident, page 35, paragraph 2. And uh, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17, we read, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, faith which is in Christ Jesus. The scripture, scripture teaches the wisdom of salvation. In uh, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Remember, we are talking about rule number two. All scripture is necessary. Nothing that the Lord has given us is to be bypassed. 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Application, the act of fixing the mind in tenses, Intenseness of thought, close study, attention, as to injure the health by application to study. Had this application be equal to his talents, his progress might have been greater. Note, if we have a hobby and we worked at it and were good at it, if we have applied ourselves to studying the Bible as much have taken the time and effort learning that skill, then we will be able to understand the wisdom of um, salvation. And so, just uh, the way... Uh, we take a skill and uh, then take our time to go through that and uh, perfect it. So we are also take the word of God. We are to uh, spend time in it. We are to make sure that uh, everything uh, is studied and uh, nothing is lost off knowing that all scripture are um, breathed by God and uh, those who study it and those who diligently search it, they'll find a rich mind uh, where they, they will not um, uh, regret that they had taken their time in studying the word of God. Take for an example, a course. Uh, people even spend sleepless nights researching, going through the materials, that have been presented by the lecturers and their teachers and their professors, they don't, want, they don't want to miss anything in these studies. And so this is how people pursue temporal things. How shall be uh, it with the eternal things? We are to take our time and um, dedicate ourselves in it so that uh, nothing that the Lord has given unto us may miss, we may miss it. Uh, rule number three, we read that uh, nothing revealed in the scripture can or will be hid from those who ask in faith, not wavering. And uh, Deuteronomy 29, Matthew chapter 10, 1 Corinthians 2, uh, Philippians 3, Isaiah 45, Matthew 21, John 14, John 14, uh, John chapter 15, James chapter 1, 1 John chapter 5. And so let us uh, look at these verses. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of the Lord. And remember, we are talking about uh, studying this by faith, not just studying it half -assedly. So 
everything that the Lord has given unto us, if they are received by faith, they'll be a blessing unto us and unto our children. Law and God's word can be in the change in the verse there. We need to figure out what is revealed because it plainly states the secret things are God's, but those things revealed belong to us. What is revealed to us that we are supposed to be trying to understand in Psalms 119, 142, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. And then sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. And so faith cometh and by hearing and by hearing the word of God. And so everything we have been given, if it is received by faith, it will be of profit to us. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a designer of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And uh, in Science of the Time, May 27, 1889, paragraph 2, the law of Jehovah is a designer of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The sinner wants to get it out of the way because it condemns him. It is thought burdensome by the transgressor, but the, to the, but the obedient can say with David, the law, the doctrine of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So when the word is taken by faith, it will have a very great import in our lives. God intends that uh, to the honest seeker, the truth of his word shall be ever folding, uh, unfolding. While the secret things belongs to God, unto the Lord, our God, those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The idea that certain portions of the Bible cannot be understood has led to, has led to neglect of some of its most important truth. The fact that needs to be emphasized and often repeated that the mysteries of the Bible are not such a because God has sought to conceal truth but because our own weakness or ignorance makes us incapable of comprehending or appropriating the truth. The limitation is not in his purpose, but in our capacity. Of those very portions of scripture often passed by as impossible to be understood, God desires us to understand as much as our minds are capable of receiving. All scriptures given by inspiration of God that we may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3, 16. This is from Education, page 170, paragraph 4. Note, she takes from the scripture and says, we cannot take the idea from here that there are any portions of the Bible um, uh, to understand and some not uh, to understand. Everything has been given to us so that uh, we may be thoroughly furnished into all truth. And so what about the book of Daniel? What about the book of Revelation? We are told that um, the book of Daniel 1 is um, a, 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 a prophecy and another is a revelation. In fact, when you read Revelation chapter 1, verses 1, it says the revelation. So it is not something that is really concealed, but something that is open. And so uh, Christ has promised anyone who asks by faith, as uh, rule number two say, number three says, nothing revealed in the scripture can or will be hid from those who ask in faith, not wavering. And so if we ask, it shall be given unto us. If uh, uh, we seek, we shall find. And if we knock, it shall be open. And uh, In the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 27, we are told, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetop. God will reveal all the secret things in the Bible to us because the scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation. And he says, Surely the Lord will do nothing uh, 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 but reveal his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Only if we approach him by faith and ask by faith. And so, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2.10, but God hath revealed them unto us, the secret things by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yet the deep things of God. And so what we need is the Holy Spirit uh, to be able to understand the things of God. And so uh, in uh, Philippians 3.15, we are told, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus perfect, 
minded and if anything ye be otherwise minded god shall reveal even this unto you and so uh and, and so if um we are perfectly minded that is uh implicitly are trusting in the lord and not wavering in our asking he shall be able to reveal these things unto thee. In Matthew 21, 22, And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive them. And uh, remember the promise of Jesus Christ in the book of John chapter 14, verse 13. And uh, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And in verse 14, he says, If you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. In John uh, chapter 15, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. And so the Lord is promising to open everything to his children, which is needful for their salvation. And so whoever asks by faith, whoever enters to study the word of God by faith, the secret things which um, are, are, are um, belongs to the children of God, he shall reveal unto them and they shall be able to understand. And uh, James chapter 1, verses 5 and verse 6, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that he giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And so, uh, in these things of the Bible is revealed eternal life. And we have confidence in the Father, uh, according to 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, that um, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us if uh, we ask anything in faith. And so we can have confidence in the Father that uh, he shall be able to reveal the things he have promised, he will reveal unto us. The rule number four, to understand doctrine, bring all the scriptures together on the subject you wish to know. Then let every word have its proper influence. And if you can form your theory without a contradiction, you cannot be in error. And uh, let us look at the proof verses. The book of uh, Isaiah 28 verse 7. But they also have air through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have air through strong drink. They are swallowed up of uh, wine, they are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision, they stumble in judgment. And so uh, they, they don't bring these um, scriptures together on the subject they wish to know. And so they are like drunkards who have no stability. In Isaiah 28, 28, 28 verse 8, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so there is no place clean. Whom shall he teach knowledge then? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine then that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast? And so uh, God wants to wean us from the milk. No longer should we be babes in Christ. In Isaiah chapter 28 verse 10, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little and there a little and uh, this is what the lord wants us because the scriptures are not hidden in any way he wants us to bring everything on the table and then uh, be able to understand every import of the word without wavering in anything without wavering in anything so uh if we will love to understand the scriptures then we have to bring everything on the table concerning that subject. And so God says that um, uh, he shall be able to speak to us. He shall be able to speak to us. And uh, looking at, uh, this is James White. Uh, I would like uh, to bring something to your attention. In, uh, Sketches of the Christian Life and Public Labors of William Miller. Uh, this is uh, what we read in page um, 48 
paragraph one uh sketches um uh, these are um, uh, sketches of the Christian life and public labors of William Miller. Sketches of the Christian life and public labors of William Miller, page 48, paragraph 1. In this way, I pursued the Bible. That is bringing scripture upon scripture, line upon line. In my first perusal of it for about two years and was fully satisfied that it is it is own interpreter. I found that by a comparison of scripture with history, all the prophecies as far as they had been fulfilled had been fulfilled literally that all the various figures, metaphors, parables, similitude, etc. of the Bible were either explained in the immediate connection or the terms in which they were expressed were defined in other portions of the word. And when thus explained are to be literally understood in accordance with such explanation. I was thus satisfied that the Bible is a system of revealed truth so clearly and simply given that the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err therein. In thus continuing the study, he adopted the following. And uh, 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 we are told that, uh, and a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness, then clean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayf wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. And so, uh, we are travelers and we are going through a journey. We are pilgrims. And so we need to bring everything that uh, uh, the Lord has given us together so that um, we may be able to understand his will. That even though we be fools, we may not err therein by bringing everything together on the table. And so in 1 Corinthians 127, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. If only we can uh, uh, bring ourselves to the methodology which God has put in place of studying his word, then we shall not err even though we are fools. And so... Um, we are to use the Bible and the Bible alone for our arguments of truth. When we shall be brought between the straight paths, then it will need us to understand uh, what is written in the Bible. Because when you look at the temptations of Jesus Christ, when you look uh, at the temptation of Jesus Christ, you find that... Um, in the book of Matthew chapter 4, he says, it is written, which means that he understood the scriptures. And so we also must understand the scriptures. And then in Matthew chapter 10, we are told, when we are brought before the councils, the spirit shall be able to tell us what to say beforehand. So if it is beforehand, then it means that uh, the Lord had brought us into that truth by searching scripture upon scripture, line upon line. Um so we need not to err in anything, although error is never harmless, it never sanctifies. And God wants us to uh, avoid having error by bringing every signification of uh, the truth together and bringing uh, all these verses together so that we may have a harmonious bearing of the doctrine that um, we, are, uh, we are dealing with. Rule uh, number five, scripture must be its own expositor since it is a rule of itself. If I depend on a teacher to expand to me and he should guess at its meaning or desire to have it so on account of his sectarian creed or to be thought wise, then his gazing, desire, creed, or wisdom is my rule and not the Bible. And so um, this is... Um, Life Incidents, page 36, paragraph 1. And so let us look at some of these verses. Psalms 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And uh, in Psalms 19.8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. And then uh, in nineteen nine, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More so... Uh, to be desired are they than gold, yeah, than the fine gold, sweeter 
also than the honey and the honeycomb. And so the, the law of God, the word of God, if studied um, and uh, left to be its own exposter will be sweeter than honey and the honeycomb to the one who is studying them. And so uh, in uh, Psalms 119 verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers for their testimonies and my meditation. We are told that uh, we are not to allow the interpretation of any man or the uh, commander to become a sectarian unto us. We are to trust in the word of God. We have to put faith in it. And then we shall have more understanding than all our teachers because the meditation of God's word is... Um, uh, the testimonies of uh, uh, God's word are our meditation. In Psalms 119 verse 100, thus we are told I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. Um, and uh, uh, the following verse, I have refrained my feet from evil way that I may keep um, thy judgment. And so uh, how do you come to understand more than the ancients, it is by keeping the precepts of God. And it is the, uh, the relying on God because uh, number five says that we should not rely on anyone. We should not allow creeds to be our guide. Cast is a man who leans upon the arm of flesh. And so God wants us to trust us that the way he gave the spirit for the authoring of his word, then he shall give us the spirit to be able to understand the same one. In fact, uh, the human heart is so deceitful above all things. Who can know it but its own maker? And so we cannot bring ourselves to coming to trust anyone to be our guide when it comes to understanding of the scriptures. The only way to unmask the many false teachers among us, the way to be able to uh, educate the people to avoid the delusions of the end time is to give them the word of God and to commit them to the Holy Spirit's guidance rather than even pointing themselves to men and women. Because today, Men and women may be this, and tomorrow they are another thing. Rule number six. Rule number six. God has revealed things to come by visions and figures and parables, and in this way the same things are often time revealed again and again by different visions or in different figures and parables. If you wish to understand them, you must combine them all in one, you must combine them all in one. In Psalms 89 verse 19, then thou speakest in vision to thy holy one and say, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen of the people. And uh, in Hosea 12, 10, uh, I have also spoken by the prophet and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. And so we have the visions and we have the similitudes. And so something to note, God, the same God, the same visions are oftentimes revealed and again and again or multiplied. When a prophet goes into a vision, God will use similitudes. What is a similitude? James 3, 9. Therefore, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith we curse women, which are made after the similitude of men. We are made of the similitude of God. Then Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Therefore, a similitude is another name for an image, a likeness, a symbol, or a representation. This is what God uses by the ministry of the prophets. That is some um, similitude, which are symbols, likeness, images. A matter of fact, similitude is where one word simile is derived from. Simile means comparing two things using like or as. Therefore, when God is going to explain a symbol, a similitude, he will do so by comparing two things 
using like or so. For example, in Jeremiah 6, 2, I have likened the death of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. Zion is compared to a woman, Zion is compared to a woman using like or as. This is a simile and how God explained to us that a woman represents the church. And so these things are multiplied and uh, you can bring all the scriptures together and see how a different word is used or how symbols are used to mean either the same thing as or like or they mean another uh, thing uh, nonetheless. And so God has promised that he will multiply visions and use similitude in Hosea 12.10. In uh, Habakkuk 2 verse 2, uh, we read something and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon the table that he may run that treated it. When God gave uh, a vision that it was made plain the tape upon the tables, the reason God told him to write upon the vision upon the table was that he may run that treated it, in other words, to encourage Bible study. Because the reason people run to and fro in the Bible is to seek, to know, to seek the word of the Lord, to understand it. And so God gave a vision to be written on tables so his people will start running through the pages of the Bible, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And remember, this is rule number six. God has revealed things to come by visions, in figures, in parables. And so as we run to and fro, we meet things which are alike. We meet similitudes. And then we can be able to understand the import of what we are reading uh, in a, 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 a greater way or in a, a more clear way. And so um, the vision of Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, um, we are told that uh, the vision was to be a shut up and the book sealed till the time of the end so that men shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. You will find that the symbols that were used in the book of Daniel, they are used in the book of Revelation. And because the book of Revelation is an unveiling, we now can understand what is in Revelation. We can now understand what is in Daniel by reading what is in the book of um, Revelation. Visions, but uh, multiplied so that uh, we may not err in the interpretation. Um God has promised in the book of Joel that uh, he will uh, pour out his spirit to upon all flesh. The sons and the daughters shall prophesy and the young men shall see vision and all men shall see dreams. Why different categories and a different usage of words? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall see dreams which means that um, this group and this group and this group, the three groups shall have uh, the truth revealed to them in different ways, yet the truth shall be one because the very spirit which shall give the visions is the same spirit that shall give prophecy and shall give dreams. And so... Another issue is that the things that happen in the Old Testament are examples to us who have come to the end of the world. And uh, the things that happen to the ancient Israel, um, when uh, the modern Israel, these things happen in the modern Israel, they can be able to understand them better because then they were used as symbols, but now they are being fulfilled in their lives. Think about the sanctuary, which was a compacted prophecy. This is uh, the gospel uh, embodied, not veiled, the sanctuary. Right now, when we read or we study through it, we find that it's being unveiled by figures and uh, by types and a uh, representation of events. And then we see in the anti-type the same things happening and which were compacted in the sanctuary. Uh, 
And so that which was a figure for that time, then in the present time, it's no longer a figure, but um, a realization or a fulfillment of the same. That which was um, a pattern becomes a reality unto us. And so God has promised to multiply uh, the visions, the dreams, and uh, the figures so that uh, we may compare and be able to understand uh, these things. And so with the presence of the Holy Spirit, we shall be able to be guided into all truths. Christ's parables are links in the chain of truth that unites man with God and with heaven. And he cannot keep them so as proverbs and parables which cannot be understood. But then the same spirit that gave the parable now through another symbol, that parable is uh, unveiled unto the searcher of the truth. And so many of um, the treasures far lie beneath the surface and can be obtained by only by diligent research and continuous effort. The truth that go to make up the great wall must be searched out and gathered. And so when that's searched out and brought together, they'll be found to be perfectly fitted to one another. Each gospel is a supplement to the others. Every prophecy, an explanation of the other. Every truth, a development of some other truth. God does not give a symbol or does not give a figure. And then uh, you find when you are interpreting it with the others that have been given, they become something so new that uh, is so different from what the symbol really uh, was um, uh, trying to point to. And so um, rule number seven is rule number seven. Thus, just looking at these rules and adding more things, Visions are always mentioned as such, 2 Corinthians 12, 1. And so let us look at this. It is not expedient for me, uh, doubtless to glory. I'll come to visions and the revelations of the Lord. And uh, uh, visions, we are seeing that uh, they are done what? Always mentioned as such. If it is a vision, the Lord will mention it's a vision. And... Um, uh, it may be able to refer to something that uh, needs to be um, interpreted or something that needs to be understood uh, as the Lord will intend it to understand. And it may not be like um, the reality. Uh, like uh, take an example of this. When Peter saw the vision of uh, a, a curtain being lowered, and we had all manner of animal, and he was told, take one and eat. That was a vision. And Peter was not allowed to eat unclean animals. But it was a vision, and he had to understand the deeper meaning of that vision. Because visions are not just something literally that will be told, lie on your side for 480 years as a um Ezekiel was told, or for certain amount of years, and then you go like there. There is a greater signification of what the vision really means. Rule number eight, figures always have a figurative meaning and are used much in prophecy to represent future things, times and events, such as mountains meaning governments, beast meaning kingdom, waters meaning people, day meaning year, and etc. So, Figures always have a figurative meaning. And so in Daniel 2.35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer, threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The same in Daniel 2.44, and in the days of this king shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom so you are seeing that um, 
the great mountain is becoming now a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all this kingdom and it shall stand uh, forever and so figures always have a figurative meaning and are used much in prophecy to represent future things times and events such as mountains meaning governments beast meaning kingdoms and waters meaning people and so mountains meaning governments and uh, beast meaning kingdom rule number nine parables are used as comparisons to illustrate subjects and must be explained in the same way as our figures by the subject in the bible and so matthew 4 13 and he said unto them know ye not this parable and how then will ye know all parables not if you don't understand this parable you'll not fully understand uh any of them if you leave out the understanding of one you will not fully comprehend the others and so you can compare that with the wedding parables and uh, uh, many times Jesus used to teach in parables, but uh, these parables that Jesus used to teach in, you could find that it was an object lesson so that um, uh, his disciples might have a deeper meaning of uh, what um, he was um, saying, of what he was saying. And so um, the Jewish people had uh, applied the prophecies that included all Israel and Christendom unto themselves, and they had built the walls of partition. And so many, many a times Jesus used to teach in parables, uh, in, uh, in parables so that um, the disciples could get a, a, a deeper meaning of what he was saying because there was an open rebellion also from the Jewish people uh, at the teachings of Jesus Christ. And so uh, he told them that um, to them has been opened the treasures of heaven that they may be able to understand these things. Uh, and uh, we should try as much as possible. And God has promised that we shall understand his word, that we may understand what these parables. If you miss one, then you may misapply the other. Rule number 10. Rule number 10. Figures sometimes have two or more different signification, as day is used in figurative sense to represent three different periods of time, namely first indefinite, Ecclesiastes 7, 14, and second definite, a day for a year, and third a day for a thousand years. So you have a day, meaning indefinite period. You have a day, definite period, that is a day for a year, and then a day for a thousand years. And so let us look at uh, these examples. And he said, um, that is Ecclesiastes, 7.14, in the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider God also has set the one against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. And so here you have indefinite uh, illustration of a day in the day of prosperity. And uh, prosperity doesn't just continue in one day. Prosperity can go for years, can go for an indefinite time. And uh, then adversity, remember, Job suffering for many days, but uh, day here is used as uh, an indefinite period. A day for a year, Ezekiel 4, 6, and when thou hast accomplished, then lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Then we have a day for a thousand. In Second Peter 3, 8, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the uh, night. And so you find that um, uh, there is the indefinite, the definite, and uh, what um, we may call um, 
uh, day for a thousand years, day for a year, and day for uh, indefinite period. So we have the indefinite and the definite. And so uh, looking at this rule number 10, figures sometimes have two or more different significations. Take an example of uh, a lion, a lion, uh, a lion as used in the scripture, it represents Jesus Christ and also it represents Satan. The con context um, determines the meaning of uh, the figure that uh, you have employed. Now, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, and uh, Revelation 22, 16, we find uh, the lion being referred to Jesus. Um, and so, just looking at um, verse 5 of Revelation, chapter 5, and one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals. And so, this one represents Jesus Christ. And in Revelation, uh, in, uh, in in First Peter, chapter 5, verse 8, we are told, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And so a figure can represent more than one thing, and uh, which are really different. You find that in Daniel 7, 4, a lion represents the, the kingdom of Babylon. The first was like a lion and eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And so this is the first empire, which was Babylon, and it is uh, likened to a lion. And uh, also, uh, a lion also can refer to uh, Judah. In uh, Genesis 49, verse 9, Judah is a lion's well. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he, cou he couched as a lion. And as an old lion who shall rouse him up. And so you find that um, one figure can represent various things. And so we should be uh, careful when interpreting things so that uh, we may not mix ourselves and uh, look at the context of everything so that we may have the right interpretation. Rule number 11, looking at rule number 11. If a word makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple law of nature, it is to be understood literally, if not figuratively. This is Life Incidents, page 37, paragraph 2, and uh, we have two verses, uh, Revelation 12 and Revelation 17. Let us look at them. Revelation 2, 1, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and uh, the moon and under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, if a word makes good sense as it stands and does not viol and does no violence to the symbol of nature, it's to be understood literally. It is contrary to the nature for a human being to be clothed with sun and to wear moon in her feet and to have um, uh, 12 stars as a crowd. This, this is just impossible. And so it cannot be, it doesn't make a good sense to take it literally. Again, in Revelation 17, 3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is also something that uh, really doesn't make sense to have such a, a, a bearing. And uh, a woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, uh, those are words that um, really does not make good sense to be taken literally, but they should be taken figuratively. And so if a word makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the symbol laws of nature, it's to be understood literally, if not figuratively. Uh, the, the verses that we have read, according to nature, it is something that uh, it is uh, uh, impossible. And uh, look at verse 7, chapter 17. 
uh, and upon her forehead, verse 5, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with the great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore did thou marvel? I'll tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which had the seven heads and ten horns. And so when you reach Revelation 17, 7, it says this is a mystery. And so this cannot be something literal. Rule number 12, to learn the meaning of a figure, trace the word through your Bible, and when you find it explained, substitute the explanation for the word, and if it make a good sense, you need not to look further. If not, look again. This is a simple rule. To learn the meaning of the figure, trace the word through your Bible, and when you find it explained, substitute the explanation for the word used, vice versa, and if it makes good sense, you need not to look our father if not look again and so rule number 13 to know whether we have the true historical event for the fulfillment of prophecy if you find every word of the prophecy after the figures are understood is literally fulfilled then you may know that your history is the true event but if one word lacks a fulfillment then you must look for another event or wait it is future development for God takes care that history and prophecy shall be shall agree so that the true believing children of God may never be ashamed. And so think about um, the prophecy of Joel. In the last days, I shall pour my spirit upon all flesh. You find that uh, history talks about the day of Pentecost. But then is it the full fulfillment of that prophecy no because after that there shall be signs in the sky and then we shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven not going up in the day of pentecost christ went up and then the outpouring of the spirit or the giving of the latter of, of the former rain was there and so the book of joel cannot be a full fulfillment on the day of pentecost because not every signification of that text was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Christ never came down here. And there, there was not the turning of um, uh, or uh, the, the, the events that are being shown in Joel chapter 2. So we can be sure to look in the full fulfillment of that uh, text in the latter period when uh, the events connected with the second coming of Jesus Christ shall be fulfill and that is why we are told that uh, to know whether we have the true historical event for the fulfillment of prophecy joel chapter 2 is a prophecy if you find every word of the prophecy after the figures are understood is literally fulfilled which we find that in joel chapter 2 not everything was fulfilled but peter quoted joel to saying that this day this has been fulfilled then you may know that your history is the true event and so we have the quotation of Peter being a true event, but um, if one word lacks a fulfillment, then you must look for another event because not every word in that prophecy was fulfilled. We can look in the future for another event, air or wait, it is future development. For God takes care that history and prophecy shall agree so that the true believing children of God may never be ashamed. And so uh, I think the, that. Uh, of your will is uh, sufficient to explain rule number 13. Rule number 14, as we bring this to a close, um, we are told the most important rule of all is that you must have faith. It must be a faith that requires a sacrifice and if tried, will give up the, desire, the dearest object on earth, the world and all its desires, character, living, occupation, friends, home, comforts, and worldly honors. If any of this should hinder our believing any part of God's word, it will show our faith to be in vain. Nor can we ever believe so long as one of these motives lies lacking in our hearts. We must believe that God will never forfeit his word and we can have confidence that he who takes notice of the sparrows uh, fall 
and numbers the hairs of her head will guard the translation of his own word and throw a barrier around it and prevent those who sincerely trust in God and put implicit confidence in his word from erring far from the truth. And so the last one is that, and the most important, that um, you must have faith. And, uh, you know, the three angels' messages are righteousness by faith. As uh, the dragon offers the materialistic temporary things to the children of uh, this world, the children of God shall live, they just shall live by faith, knowing that uh, no earthly affiliation can make them waver from the faith that is what Christ has promised to the children who love him. And even though the things of the world may seem so alluring, they still have to have this implicit faith in our Lord Jesus Christ that um, uh, nothing in this world shall uh, uh, shall can replace uh, their faith in Jesus Christ. And having faith uh, will help us avoid uh, being misled in any way. Because once you have faith in Jesus Christ, whatsoever any other thing that will be brought unto you, which is not of Christ, thou shalt be able to resist it because you have an anchor that you cannot be uh, ashamed of. And so, uh, what is faith? Faith is believing that that which God has promised he will do, he will do it. It doesn't matter how much it shall turn. You wait for it, so we are told in Habakkuk. And he shall not be pleased with those who draw back. And so uh, we must sanctify the Lord in our hearts and uh, be able to answer with these rules, which are not, I cannot say that the 14 rules are conclusive. No, William Miller picked or was given what was the best for his time. But God is not limited in the 14 rules. God is above all this. But um, we can safely use these 14 rules and come to a biblical truth. Somebody may say as uh, I close, but um, Miller used these rules and he came to a wrong event in 1844. Yes, he got the timing right, but the event was wrong. Why? Because of the word, the sanctuary. But why did this happen? It is because the Lord himself wanted his servant to still walk closer and closer with him and not trusting himself. And so, he didn't have to cast his confidence aside, but he had to continue trusting in the Lord. And in due time, God could have revealed the signification or the meaning of the word sanctuary. And then that which seemed as a disappointment could have proved a joy unto his life. And so whenever we find ourselves wrong and we are diligently studying and putting everything on the table as we have been told. And we err in some place. It doesn't mean that God has cast us off, but it just means that we have to still continue relying on God more and more because human being can err when they veer their vision of the Lord who is leading them. But he is faithful that uh, if uh, we draw back to him and lean on him implicitly, that he shall be able to guide us in all truth. And uh, not only Mila is the one that uh, has ever erred. You look at the, 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 the disappointment that the apostles had when they had uh, taken the prophecies that they had in the, in the scrolls and thought that Christ was coming to establish a literal kingdom when actually he was establishing a spiritual kingdom. 
Did it mean that God had cast them off and he had led them into error? No, he wanted them to continue relying on him. And in due time, that which seemed obscure and uh, not understandable was rightly understood. And it brought joy to the disciples and they went um, uh, ahead. They went forward with the work doing marvelous things. And so we should not take the 14 rules by Miller and say, if this man really followed this rule and he came, he, he was able to end up in error, then it means that we cannot trust in this rule. No, the disciples had the scriptures, they had the scrolls, but they also misunderstood something. And so uh, Miller was not the first person to be disappointed. Look again at John the Baptist and uh, uh, his uh, uh, seeming disappointment when he says that go ask him is he the one or should we wait for another think about this question that um, this man was really asking or was inquiring about this is the man that hadn't known jesus christ and the one who sent him to baptize jesus said if you shall see the one you shall see the spirit Rest on him like a dove. That is the person. And he saw this. He heard the voice. This is my beloved son. Yet he was overwhelmed at a certain point with doubts. And then he said, go ask him. And Jesus Christ did not rebuke John the Baptist. No, he says that of all the men who have ever lived, that there is no one mightier than John the Baptist. And so the era of William Miller and the 14 rules is not something new. John the Baptist had it. Think about Elijah again. Elijah had been assured by God that he will be with him. But then he flees from Jezebel when he had really been promised that the Lord will be with him. Why really flee? And so there are many things that have happened to them servants of God. That it doesn't mean that they were in error per se, but actually uh, what it just tells us that we are human beings and if we do not rely on God fully, then uh, 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 we shall be in uh, uh, a position where we shall not be able to go all through the way with the Lord. And so I just... Uh, want to thank the Lord and uh, I'll encourage us that um, as uh, we go through this series of uh, uh, as, uh, as we go through this series that uh, the Lord will continue guiding us into all truth and uh, that which seems obscure we can trust that uh, he will be able to explain to us the things that uh, seems um, uh, are so difficult to understand. Otherwise, the Lord bless us and may he continue being with us. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, thank you once again. I just pray that uh, you may continue shining your face upon us and uh, as we study, the Lord, we may not put trust in self, but we may put trust in Jesus Christ. And he say, how be it when the spirit come, he shall lead you into all truth. What we want is truth. For error does not sanctify, but sanctify them with the truth. Thy word is truth. Help us to understand the things that have been given unto us and belongs to our children. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, may the Lord bless us as we continue studying his work. Bye for now.